So how can bodybuilders reduce the harm related to anabolic steroids? Find out more after this. Hello and welcome to another episode of Balance My Hormones with Dr. George Tuliatos and our question time. Um, I'm Mike and I'm here with Dr. George uh, and we're going to talk about a few different topics of interest. Some of them have come from our Facebook group and um, so we'd like for you to, uh, if you can, subscribe and also uh, put some comments for other content that you would like to see. So we'll start with George. Jo George Tuliatos is... Um, a TRT specialist based in Greece and one of the directors of Balance My Hormones for Europe. And we're here to talk about a few interesting topics today. Hi, George. Hello, Michael. Have a good evening. Um, so it's been a while since we were in Columbus, Ohio, and we had our last show, which was the HRT in May. It was a pretty successful video. I think, it's, I think so. I think we had thousands yeah. of views on that one. 6,000, yeah. <laughs> I was counting. <laughs> So no, and that was such a surreal time is right before the coronavirus. And, you know, we were in Columbus and had some freedom to mostly go about, even though most of the expo for the Arnold Classic was canceled. It, yeah. um, uh, it was, it was the last, it was the last column before the, the storm, you know? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, but we had some fun nonetheless. And you know, now you're back in Greece and Athens. I'm, I'm back in the UK. So um, it's good to finally get back to doing some of this and, and, and offering content and good, good to see you. So, so one of the first topics that we, we wanted to discuss was you, know, you, you have a background in bodybuilding and bodybuilding is a peculiar sport. I mean, many young men get involved in bodybuilding either for you know, the, the pure competition for it. I'm not really sure, um, but they're drawn into it maybe for the look. So let's talk about a little bit about your background in bodybuilding and then your evolution into helping men reduce harm as a doctor from uh, the effects of either anabolic steroids or some of the negative parts of the lifestyle that go along with bodybuilding. So um, can you tell us a little bit about how you started with the, the bodybuilding uh, and the interest and, and how it kind of moved into you wanting to help men uh, reduce harm related to the more uh, anabolic steroid abuse? Yeah, so it, it started, uh, as we mentioned in our first, um, very first video, I started as a, um, competitive bodybuilder at age 26, right after I finished my obligations with medical school and I was practicing in the country as a general practitioner. And my career finished at uh, right, uh, I, was fin I was ending my residency in 2013 at the age of 40. So yes, I wanted to become the doctor of the bodybuilding community. And uh, since I walked the talk, so I started experimenting with uh, androgenic anabolic steroids right after med school. So I had some, uh, I had some background, some scientific background. And I was able to examine myself in the clinics, in the public clinics, hospitals I was working at. So since I would walk the talk and, of course, writing down my experiences as an author in Greece and later in the uh, U.S., um, in books and online, Yes, I wanted to become the doctor of the medical of the bodybuilding community. Now I have the shows, of course, with the MD. But you have to know that 99 or 100% of the bodybuilders face later the um, anabolic steroid-induced hypogonadism, which is a late onset hypogonadism, and all of them will eventually need uh, some of the testosterone, uh, either 100 or 200 milligrams, and most of them use 250. So one of my patients is a legendary FEB pro with 48 shows, and actually he won one in uh, 2012 in Spain now. This guy, uh, he's a 50-year-old guy now, and uh, he told me that uh, he needs at least 250 a week. So, of course, this dose is super physiological because roughly at 200, 200 milligrams you reach the levels of, of course according to your metabolism or to your bmi but 200 milligrams are fair enough to reach 1100 uh, uh, picograms which is the highest dose in in the states of course according to your age 1100 you're, you're talking nanograms yeah. per deciliter Total and, and, yeah, total so, so. and that's usually measured on trough then yeah at the lowest point and so the thought uh, could be higher when it when it peaks 
yes, yes, of course, because when you inject, for instance, on Monday, then on Tuesday, Wednesday is going to spike, and on the weekend it's going to be low. So shooting once a week has this kind of disadvantage and fluctuations, but it, kick, it kicks your, your sex drive two, two days later. However, your free testosterone will be at the lowest level to one or two days before. Uh, uh, yes, so bodybuilding, of course, is, uh, is a multi-stack of other testosterone derivatives that obviously they deviate the standard uh, uh, labs, such as liver panel, kidney panel, like heart panel, and cholesterol. You know, CBC also, homocysteine, all these evaluations are messed up during steroid abuse. And of course, HRT and TRT is about optimization and physical mental health. It has nothing to do with super muscle gains, you know, and extreme uh, performance enhancement. I mean, what, so what's the motivation for other younger people, I suppose, because you start when you're younger, to, to get into bodybuilding? And, and what is, um, is it a, a more of a psychological desire to yeah I think so anorexia or some sort of reverse anorexia or or is it a, a pure sport where it's the drive for competition to, to you know shape the body like an uh, like a sculpture well actually it's all of them but I believe according to a study was in uh, Harvard there is um, um, how you say it um, the muscle dysmorphia is the, the reverse of uh, anorexia nervosa, but mainly is loss of self-confidence when someone needs to build his self-esteem through uh, the use of uh, steroids for his uh, own reasons, because he's not so good looking or perhaps he's no other directions to, to educate himself. But anyway, uh, he wants to improve his uh, sexual performance. He wants to improve his personal relationship, even his performance at, at work, you know, uh, to become more attractive and uh, have more self-confidence. But also, it's a, it's a matter of competing in sports. But of course, as Rick Collins said, 90% uh, the majority of uh, anabolic and allogenic steroid users are not athletes because uh, those agents are banned from sports, you know, IOC mm -hmm. and WADA USADA. So the majority of them are people recreational users who want to improve their lifestyle and for their ego and uh, self-esteem, you know, issues. So these are the recreational bodybuilders, the, the weekend warriors yes. that are... the average gym rat guy, you know, who, who, you, who faces the gym five times a week, you know, uh, wants to socialize and have a better sex drive, you know, and be more attractive to his girlfriend or to the other, the other sex. So could it be when you say they want to have a better sex drive that maybe there's some deficiency in the first place? Maybe it's not just psychological, but perhaps there is a linkage. If if these if these young men or, or you know had, had tested their the levels before they started taking anabolic steroids, then perhaps we would have a different picture to say, well, maybe these are the men who aren't being treated by the medical community. Do you think there's some validity in that? Yeah, well, we have to know that uh, abusing steroids. Uh, does not uh, always lead to better sex drive because there are other hormones that fluctuate, such as estradiol, prolactin, you know. Um, and these are play also an important role in sex drive, and uh, SHBG also plays a role. Of course, if you abuse several, um, several grams of testosterone, and generally androgens will crash on SHBG and will liberate more of free testosterone. But also there comes to play other factors such as IGF-1, prolactin, uh, DHT levels, and estradiol that affect perhaps uh, gynecomastia or libido issues. So uh, after, after a while, the need, there is the need for, for HG in order to kick your own production, okay? So there are some bodybuilders that uh, complain of poor sex drive even though they are blasting two grams of testosterone, and then you have to use some HG for your own production, you know, and better semen production, you know? So it's multifactorial. It doesn't mean that you are using a lot of gear. Of course, trembolone and nandrolone, the nylon testosterone derivatives, suppress the natural production, you know, and it's multifactorial. Do you think that trembolone and nandrolone are some of the contributing factors for the diminishment in, in sex drive for some men? Or have you heard of those helping, uh, you know, men have even better sex drives? Because I, I've heard of people having mixed messages. However, from the, the trend uh, 
one is always is never prescribed and two you don't know what you're getting so i suppose the question is um when you go outside when we're, we're talking about anabolic steroids we're not talking about natural trt testosterone replacement the the dosages and the and the drugs are vastly different is, is that right yes uh, actually when you're using 1919 19, 19, notices on the river just um um the derivative of it which is tremble on the ratio between testosterone and 19 or should be two to one so if you use one to one like the other drugs dhc derivatives and other steroids then you may have experienced an issue with sex drive uh, of course the natural production of testosterone is completely shut off from day one because of testosterone use okay but still, we need more elevated testosterone, the androgen part, and the, uh, to be higher than the anabolic part, okay? And especially with those two uh, drugs. So George, tell me, when you're doing the anabolic steroid harm reduction program, what does that normally consist of uh, with the patient? I mean, what, what sort of uh, techniques do you apply or recommendations? Yeah do you make in, in general for, for one who... So, yes, the most important and significant system is the cardiovascular because, frankly, you die in a heartbeat with an acute myocardial infarction or a cerebral stroke. So we have to take care of certain parameters such as homocysteine that predicts stroke and also heart issues. So homocysteine is a compound that elevates with anabolic steroids, with also smoking, and it has to be below 10, so single digits. Uh, at least before the steroid cycle and after, of course, it's elevated. We have homocysteinemia and then we have to lower it. Also, the lipid panel that consists of the lipoprotein fractions of high density and low density lipoproteins known as the good cholesterol HDL and the bad cholesterol LDL, triglycerides, total cholesterol, and some genetic factors such as LPA, lipoprotein A, apple lipoprotein A, apple A, and apple lipoprotein B, apple B. So, all this panel uh, is uh, in regards to the Cardiovascular, but also a CBC where we met, where we um, we calculate we uh, and we measure the uh, hemoglobin and the percentage of the hematocrit, but also thrombocytes play a role for uh, thrombosis, you know, and coagulation, uh, blood viscosity. So this is also a part the the CBC, you know. The C-reacting protein also may reveal some um, inflammation in the endothelium of arteries, you know, and especially the high sensitive C-reactive protein. So this is the cardiovascular panel. Now then we have the lipid panel, the, I'm sorry, the liver panel that consists of the liver enzymes, ALT and AST or SGOT, SGOPT, and also the cholestatic enzymes, the GGT and the ALP, alkaline phosphatase, and also the bilirubin, the, uh, the total and the uh, indirect bilirubin, okay? And then we have also the renal uh, panel, which consists of urea, creatinine, uric acid, potassium, and also glomerulonitration rate, which is a formula actually. The EGFR, uh, is that right? EGFR, yes. And we also me measure the clearance of the creatinine in 24 urine collection. In case GFR is low, you know, below 60, for instance, that is also related to serum creatinine. The creatinine also elevates by BMI. The more muscle you have, the more creatinine possessed in the muscle, that metabolizes to creatinine, you know? That's why huge guys of BMI is over 30, for instance, uh, two meters tall and 150 kilograms, they have a highest range of creatinine to 1.5 in regards to other people who are of smaller size and it's 1.2, for instance. Well, doesn't that throw off the EGFR calculation when they take into account urea and creatinine? When, uh, I mean, is there a special way to look at the bodybuilder who has more muscle yes, of mass? of course, uh, yes. So more muscle means higher creatinine, okay? And more abdomyolysis, more CPK, means uh, also higher creatinine because the more muscle you have, the higher the CPK and the excreted hemoglobin for the muscles is more toxic to the kidneys, you know? But so, but would the EGFR measure for someone who has that high amount of musculature actually with the thresholds that are set to say, oh, you might have... Um, a de a degrading uh, function of your kidneys would that actually apply to uh, someone who's more muscly than than the, the average person yes it isn't so accurate in a huge guy in a bodybuilder so you have to measure the 24 hour uh, urine creatinine clearance collecting your urine for in bottles for one day 24 hours and then measure the clearance of that um 
Yeah, of course, uh, along with kidney function, also blood pressure comes into relations because kidneys regulate blood pressure. And if you're using drugs that elevate blood pressure, such as Tremblor or CNS stimulants, actually all the steroids elevate blood pressure through aldosterone, but especially Tremblor does. And when it's through the renin angiotensin system, and when blood pressure rises, then the glomerulus uh, becomes harder. We have the hardening uh, glomerulosclerosis in the in the kidney, and then uh, that's why trembolone affects the kidneys through the uh, elevation of the blood pressure, the systemic blood pressure. So I, I read a paper the other day about um, actually a case study of a young bodybuilder who was admitted to hospital with various issues, um, you know, pain in his abdomen and he was scanned by his, his ultrasound by his GP and couldn't find anything, but was admitted to hospital. Well, it turns out, um, you know, he had further scans done, further testing done. He shown he had kidney damage, eventually liver damage. And as it, as it turns out, the, the substances he was taking uh, were laced with arsenic, was um, responsible for his death. So it's really poison. Arsenic, arsenic is a heavy metal yeah. that was used as a poison. <laughs> yeah, so, but I guess the point is, the, the substances people are taking, obviously, they, they can't go to a doctor and say, hey, I'm a bodybuilder. Can you help me with a, with a hormone treatment? Obviously, that's something that would be considered doping and that doesn't happen. It's unethical, but, yes. Yeah, so they have, they're forced to go onto the black market. So just by the very nature of the system, some of these poor people are put in harm's way because their overriding desire or their overriding condition of either bigorexia or desire to, to go in that direction it leads them down a dark path of getting uh, you know, very much tainted uh, poisons, essentially. Testosterone that in and of itself isn't bad. It's, it's what it's been um, tainted with, with being you know, some sort of heavy metal. So I, there, I are some, there are some underground uh, materials, as Bill Welling also said, that they contain heavy metals inside. Okay, they're also contaminated. And about the doctor community, the medical community, it's super, it's uh, prodigious and uh, suspicious about the steroids because we bodybuilders gave it a bad name to the abuse. And testosterone is not a villain. Testosterone is, is a drug that is not replaceable under, uh, under hypogonadism. For instance, Kleinerforte syndrome, which is primary hemoglobin, you become, you, be, you are born like this. So you need testosterone for life. But testosterone, you know, it's, it's blamed because of its abuse. And actually, it's a familiar hormone, you know, it's not a synthetic derivative that's supposed to be toxic. So, uh, yes, uh, another reason is because the medical community does not train at all, does not have any, any connection with physical uh, activity, you know. So they are total clueless about what the benefits of in performance enhancing uh, um, effects, you know, of steroids. So they have this kind of darkness, you know, <laughs> they, they do not know about anything of the benefits in self-esteem or even in in physical appearance or in body composition you know so how many people would you estimate that, that end up going down that route um may have actually had a kind of pre-existing hypogonadism and didn't even realize it. it it almost as if in nature they sought out you talk stuff. about bodybuilders yeah bodybuilders i mean could it be i mean i've always had this thought that you know, someone goes into the gym, they see their mate making loads of muscle gains, and their, their mates may, may actually be completely natural because they're genetically gifted. They're not getting to the same point, so therefore they seek out these substances to kind of level the playing field. And, but in reality, perhaps they were deficient in the first place. Are we to completely beat them up over that decision? Or, I mean, what, what is the, uh, I mean, what, what can we do to kind of, I suppose, help these young people um, you know, get, get back to level of normality? I mean, what, what, what's your recommendation? Well, when, when somebody wants to, to become jacked, you know, and uh, veiny and have a six pack, it's obvious that no matter what is your normal testosterone, your, your own production of testosterone, even if it's 900 over 1,000, it still is not enough to make those muscles. It's just about sex drive, okay? So I remember one of my patients now who's a, uh, is an amateur bodybuilder, he's into cycles. The very first time we, we met in 2015, five years ago, he had a super hot girlfriend and he was very sexually active with her and he thought the social was 950. But still, this was not enough for him to build those, this exceptional body that he was dreaming of. After he was blasting steroids, then his own production started to diminish, you know, and, he won and after PCD protocols, he couldn't satisfy his uh, next girlfriend. So. I mean, 
uh, it's not enough your own testosterone to build this body that you are dream of. It's just about having self-esteem, a good health, and a good sex drive. But making this kind of body with extra muscle and low body fat, then it's, it's required for ex uh, external under androgen supply that later will lead to primary, after secondary, and late onset hypogonadism, which is a combination of primary, secondary. This is what I had also after 15 years of on, on off in cycles. And after seven months, I couldn't recover. And I, I remember in particular, I was waiting for 30 weeks and my total testosterone was about 150. And then I realized it was inevitable to, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't wait for more six months, another six month period, you know? So yes, I started using testosterone, but of course this is, has nothing to do with the grams I was abusing, two grams a week, for instance, in my, in my prime and in my peak, okay? It's about physical and mental, uh, mental and physical health and optimization. Uh, it's not about the silver bullet that transforms me, you know, but in case you are hypogonadal, then you're gonna feel a substantial improvement in your levels, okay? And uh, going from 200 to 800 is, is, a, is a major difference, you know? So part of the program for anabolic steroid reduction is really to help men who, I suppose, hang up the towel on the thoughts of um, bodybuilding in, in the way that they did it before. After doing multiple cycles, they, they're looking for a route to being, um, I, I guess, healthy again. And so you're saying after so many cycles, after so much PCT, they can't get their levels back to normal. So the only healthy route is then to do TRT. And, yes, and, yes. And that's one way to help them to do it safely. Actually, some doctors believe that PCT is a waste of time, you know, but you know, frankly, PCT is a good uh, refractory period between the two cycles. So in order to satisfy your girlfriend, to have a decent recovery at the gym, you know, and uh, not to crash as hypogonadal. So it leaves your own production. The point is, we're not sure if it's gonna stay there. So if PCT is gonna work. It's supposed to be HG and SERMS combination. And of course, time is a healer, but you're not sure that it's gonna take up to the levels that you initially started before abusing. Do you think because the body gets spoiled on a higher level whilst they're on uh, injectable or topical testosterone, so usually they're injectable, I believe. I believe after our age, we decline. So after 50, 35 or uh, 40, as we approach to underpose the, uh, the natural endogenous testosterone production shuts off, but of course, after, after repeated, repeated abuse of steroids, then the, there is a, not only saturation of the antigen receptors, but there is a gradual hypogonadism that takes place with the shrinkage of the testicles, but also the, hypo, the, the hypophysis and the hypothalamus cannot kick. I mean, do you think it's because you actually get more antigen receptors from the continuous yes. use? Yes, also and another it. reason, yes. A major factor for HPTH suppression is the androgenicity of the particular steroid. So trembolone halo testing and um, testosterone itself that are high androgen that are considered as high androgens they suppress because they bind tightly to the androgen receptor in the brain and this is a factor for suppression other factors are estrogen production that are negative feedback for GnRH and NLH but synthesis uh, production also um, prolactin like 19 nor uh, deca and trend all right of course uh, time abuse and dose abuse. So all these factors come into play. What has, what have you seen as far as the effects of testosterone causing these elevations in prolactin in men? What, what's the percentage of men that you could say you've seen the, the effects of testosterone? Do you think it's just related to the uh, exogenous androgens raising the prolactin? I mean, or do you think there are other factors like uh, second? No, reasons, reasons to have high prolactin are also uh, use of opiates, marijuana, excessive stress and insomnia, hypothyroidism also, you know. So not just about using DECA or TREN. By the way, also it's more favorable for prolactin to elevate when it's also already an estrogenic environment. So it's, uh, it's multifactorial. Mm -hmm. And you know, as a matter of fact, prolactinemia leads to, uh, I mean, uh, prolact no, uh, primitive ejaculation is, is treated with SSRIs that lead to prolactinemia. So with elevated pro prolactin, uh, you cannot uh, have, a, you know, you have an orgasmia, which is you cannot finish, you cannot 
ejaculate. Ejaculate because of the high prolactin, yeah. So, so what are the treatments then normally? Uh, a Cabergolin, which is a dopamine agonist or bromocriptin. Okay. Okay. To, to you, lower... Uh, do you prefer one over the other? Sorry? Do you prefer one type over the other? Of yes, I prefer uh, Dostinex, which is uh, Cabergolin Brios, bromocriptin has a plethora of side effects. Yeah. You know, Parlodel is uh, bromocriptin. So uh, Dostinex comes in half a milligram and one milligram tablets. So yes, you choose a low dose. You can cut it in half either, so you get a quarter of a milligram. So... Uh, you can manage those. All right. So, any any other recommendations you have for men that are seeking advice from reducing harm related to anabolic steroids? I mean, what what uh, what could they look for? Uh, we have they have to use um, some uh, ancillary supplements uh, as precautions, you know, for the lipid panel. So instead of uh, instead of statins that I do not recommend and within the cycle because statins also they are hepatotoxic. They also uh, induce rhabdomyolysis, which is also a fact in uh, under heavy training that also rhabdomyolysis further uh, affects the liver and strains the liver, also the kidneys. So I tell them to use red by yeast that acts as a phytosterol without the nasty side effects. Uh, bergamot, um, polycosinol, uh, phytosterols that are phytoestrogens, uh, essential fatty acids and krill oil, niacin also for the HDL, okay? Eat plenty of essential fatty acids uh, from uh, flaxseed, from peanut butter, from, uh, mac uh, from macadamia oil, you know, olive oil, um, avoid trans fat, avoid saturated fats, mainly with simple sugars. So follow a pure Mediterranean diet, uh, hydrate uh, in uh, low sodium water, and you can take some uh, glutathione injectable or NAC along with um, some glutamine, some milk thistle for the liver. You know, alpha lipoic acid also is a potent antioxidant. Uh, you can also deny it before starting the cycle in order to get rid of the extra blood, you know. And also take precautiously one milligram of, uh, I'm sorry, 80 milligrams, one baby aspirin uh, in case your CBC is elevated. So over 18 or 54 percent hematocrit. All right, pentoxifilin also might help circulation, okay, in case your hemoglobin is elevated. Uh, check out your blood pressure, okay, uh, stop using exogenous uh, salt, you know, table salt and sodium. Yes, these are factors in order to, to lower the, the harm, you know, you know and uh, preserve uh, uh, health and longevity. Okay, that sounds like a good plan. All right, well, so that's the topic, anabolic steroid reduction, or harm, sorry, that's the topic, anabolic steroid harm reduction with Dr. George, um, one of, one of the, uh, the services he offers to, to patients that are interested. Uh, thanks again for coming on to another uh, episode of Dr. Um, Tudiatos's Question Time uh, with Balance My Hormones. So thanks again for watching. Uh, press like if you like the video uh, and please subscribe to the channel and we hope to see you next time.